Good evening. Uh, hello, good evening. Yes, it's great to have everybody here. I've got this nervous energy just pulsating right in front of me here. It's going to be cool. You got water right behind you if you need it, right? I just want to say hello and welcome to the 104th Bailey Oratorical. How about... I've been waiting a long time for this, which I'll get to in a second, but I do want to say uh, welcome to all of our students and guests and families that are out there, uh, to our faculty who have prepared our students uh, across the curriculum, and not just in the Department of Communications, but everywhere, who have really nurtured these students to this point, uh, our judges who will be introduced in a moment. Um, I also want to say hello to former President Tom Keppel and his wife Pat, our former provost up there, uh, Dr. Laxo. It's great to have you with us uh, uh, and join us in this uh, wonderful event. So as I said, I've been waiting for this moment for quite some time, and I'll tell you why. A year ago, there were, there were how many of you attended this last year? Raise your hand. OK. What was the topic? Do you remember? Right, advice to me. The topic for those of you who aren't familiar was, what advice would you give Juniata's next president? I am sitting in my kitchen a year ago today uh, watching a live stream, thanks to Donna, uh, her suggestion that I log in and heard seven tremendous students uh, give me advice on what to do when I arrived on your campus last June. A couple of emotions were running through my mind at that moment. Aside from being blown away by the talent that I had witnessed uh, via a very poor internet connection, I was about to crawl under my couch based on all the advice I had received that evening. It was wonderful advice. It was great advice, and much of it, quite frankly, uh, I have tried to follow. But there was one phrase I wanted to share in the spirit of the Bailey Oratorical that I had used in my inaugural address, and it was by Seth Ruggiero, who is now a senior, and he had said this. And for me, this is my Bailey moment. He had said to me, and I remember sitting on my couch thinking, that, that is why I'm going to Juniata. He had said, Dr. Trohan, do not try and change Juniata. Let Juniata change you. And for me, that has sunk in, and it was in this moment, in this room, where those er words were uttered by, for the students, your peers, and uh, for a lot of people to listen and take to heart. And I will tell you, I have taken that to heart as I have started my journey as your 12th president. If you haven't heard or don't know, 1910, this program established by Letitia Fisher Bailey and Thomas F. Bailey, the wife and the son of John M. Bailey, for whom this event was established. Thomas, the son, served as president judge of Huntington County from 1916 to 1936. And John M. Bailey also served in that same capacity as president judge. Today, through an endowment contributed by Judge Bailey's son-in-law, the late Colonel Sedgley Thornberry, there are three prizes that we'll be giving out tonight. First, plot, first prize is $1,000. Second prize is $500. Second place prize is $500. And third place is $300. In addition, the name of the winner, inscribed on an antique loving cup given by Colonel Thornberry's son, Thomas Bailey Thornberry. One of the great things about this contest is that it is the oldest ongoing tradition of academic excellence that we have here at Juniata. And for those of you who follow me on Twitter, I tweeted last night that amidst madrigal and storming and lobster fest and mountain day, this is yet another one of our wonderful and extraordinary traditions which I am so proud to be a part of. So tonight, the contest, the question, that these fine individuals will be addressing is this. What will it take for freedom 
and justice and equality to ring for all. One more time. What will it take for freedom, justice, and equality to ring for all? I now turn the program over to Dr. Donna Weimer, Thornberry Professor of Communication. She will introduce our judges for this evening's contest. Thank you again for being here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, President Troja. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Professors Cockett, Fala, Worley, and I are so pleased to have you share our interest and enjoyment in public speaking. The Dalai Lama said, it is our collective and individual responsibility to preserve and tend to the world in which we live. I would like to salute the 34 students who participated in the preliminary round last week who tended to the world in which we live. They did that through their speeches. These speeches diversely represented the issues of inequality and the need for social justice, ranging from the discrimination against ideas, voter registration, competitive structures of capitalism, the bravery needed in Burma, the problems of the beauty industry, fracking, LGBT rights, bullying, and the celebration of our own Standing Stone Coffee House as a microcosm of how little bits of good can make a big difference. It should not go unnoticed, the very first speech at 8 a.m. last Saturday was in The Truth Sets Free, Veritas Liberat. The whole speech was built around our motto, and that is what we will hear tonight. I wish you could have heard them all. These speeches represent the best of Juniata. The judges who made that Saturday event an academic challenge were Colleen Hughes-Grotter, class of 06, Julia Bogue, class of 10, 2010 that is, and Anthony Grotter, a good friend of Juniata. They traveled from afar, spent a precious Saturday to give back to Juniata, evaluate speeches, choose finalists, write critiques, help our Juniata students benefit from the preliminary round feedback, whether they placed as a finalist or not. We simply have the best alums and friends. Please help me thank them for sharing their dedication to the art and craft of public speaking. Those judges are listening to the live stream, so they appreciated the, the applause. I would be remiss if I didn't publicly thank some folks, Jesse Sullivan and Chad Herzog, for arranging this theater space into an agora of excellence and eloquence. Megan Myers, a 2016 grad, and Morgan Harrell, a 17 grad, Nathan Wagner, and a band of stalwart digital technicians for coordinating the live streaming. We have made one of the oldest academic events at Juniata High Tech. So thanks for the coordination and effort, and welcome to everyone who is turning, tuning in. So once again, a big hello to Bandun, Indonesia, where his parents will be listening. We thank our Communication and Media Club for their sponsorship, and Heather Bumbarger for hours of invisible labor that make this event in Juniata look so good. And Pat Musselman, who has been with me for 25 years, she came back. She's here out of retirement to once again watch the event. Tonight we have three distinguished judges faced with the difficult challenge of choosing three winners. In each of their professions, speaking effectively is crucial to success and to their active participation in their communities. The competition is rigorous, and I must tell you, the communication department is so grateful that we are not the judges. So, very briefly, um, if you could just stand when I call your name. Our first judge is Breton Jew Mitchell, a 2006 graduate. He graduated. His POE was in PACS and communication. He uh, was part of various AmeriCorps programs in California, Louisiana, and Mississippi, and eventually had him returning home. He is currently a training program manager on the staff at Penn State. He is part of the university's World in Conversation. It's a center for public di diplomacy. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. 
and a friend of Juniata, Anne Benzel. Uh, Benzel, I'm sorry. <clears throat> she currently serves as the president of Benzel Bretzel's Bakery, Inc. They did that on purpose, <laughs> right? Fourth generation family business and operation since 1911 in Altoona, Pennsylvania. How many of you have had a Bretzel? <gasps> Look at all those hands. This is fabulous. She is well known for her generous and long, pre long impressive service to the arts and the humanities in central Pennsylvania. She's known for her work on the restoration of the historic Mishler Theater. Many of you may know that if you know Altoona. She is one of only two people in Pennsylvania to chair both the Governor's Council on the Arts and the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. In May of 2002, she was named one of Pennsylvania's top 50 women in business. Thank you, Anne, for being here. <clears throat> Dr. Maurice Taylor, a 72 grad with a POE <laughs> in, in sociology, is vice president for academic outreach and engagement at Morgan State University and the former dean of Morgan School of Graduate Studies. He is also and has been uh, a very, very generous trustee of Juniata College. Maurice Taylor is Vice President for Academic Outreach. He is in charge of their online degree programs, the Division of Continuing Education, the Summer Session, the Winter Session. It is a huge list. We are so very, very grateful for your time this evening, Dr. Taylor. <clears throat> and now for our finalists. I'm going to announce their names in the order in which they will be speaking. All right. James Taylor, 2014 Communication and English POE. Second, Angela Myers, a 2014 Secondary Education English POE. Colton Hallibuck, 2015 Health Communications. Ezra Nikki Halstead, 2015 The Discourses of War and Peace. I lost my place. Five, Alexandra Bernoski, 2016, Russian Language and Culture. Number six, Ronaldo Liam, 2014, Finance and Communication. Last but not least, number seven, Elise Moranian, 2014, International Business and Communication. Many ask us what criteria the, judge use, the judges use, especially when you disagree. So really, they do have criteria. In brief, the speeches are persuasive intent. In a very short amount of time, these finalists will invite you to share their point of view. Their overall residual message must be clear, and they must support it with a clear line of reasoning and a variety of evidence. In addition, they must adapt their message to this particular audience, engage us emotionally, and enhance their message with effective delivery. All this in eight minutes. It's like walking on water, easy. Tacitus said that eloquence burns bright and we will all be illuminated. So let's not wait a minute longer. Best wishes to the finalists. May Hermes, the god and protector of ancient oratory, guide you to your eloquence. James Taylor. <clears throat> Five pennies will make a difference. A dime will make a difference. A nickel will make a difference. That's why it's called change. On March 25, 1965, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood on the steps of the Alabama State Capitol and addressed the crowd saying, 
I know you are asking today, how long will it take? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. This powerful idea can be traced to a once influential Unitarian minister, Theodore Parker. In his 1853 sermon entitled Justice and Conscience, Dr. Reverend Parker, an abolitionist, declared, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can't divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. I agree that the arc bends towards justice. It bends towards change. But here's the thing. It does not bend on its own. It bends because each of us, in our own way, put a hand on that arc, and we push in the direction of justice. Reverend Parker's words push us to consider the tensions in our moral universe, namely the power of the, of the human spirit and the purpose of the human spirit on one hand and the poverty of the human spirit on the other. The poverty of the spirit, the easily surrendered to spirit, is the one that keeps us to ourselves remaining selfish while the rest of the world struggles to survive. The power and the purpose of the human spirit are the infectious and the triumphant kind when we choose to reach beyond ourselves and into the world. Reverend Parker's words offer us a chance to look at the push and pull of the moral universe. Do we fight for what we believe and feel to be true or do we surrender to the easy road with and offer nothing? The Reverend Dr. King in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize said, there is a sort of poverty of the spirit which stands in glaring contrast to our scientific and technological abundance. The richer we become materially, the poorer we have become morally and spiritually. But we have not learned the art of simple getting along together like brothers. The art of standing shoulder to shoulder is quickly becoming a lost art. This is what pulling pressure, putting pressure on the arc of the moral universe means to me. It means resisting the temptation of selfishness. I can't do it all, but I can stand next to those who are struggling, suffering, and without, and remind them that they are not alone. I can only hope that who I am and what I am will be a reminder that my one can become many, and when there is many, more can be done. When President Obama signed to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, he said, we are not a nation that says don't ask, don't tell, we are a nation that says, out of many, we are one. This is bending the arc. Putting pressure on that which is familiar and normal isn't going to change things. It's not going to make everyone happy. But how do you think change is made? How are freedom, justice, and equality to ring true for us all if we are too lazy and too selfish to stand up and stand our ground for what we know and feel to be right? Some will be uncomfortable under the pressure we are putting against their ark, and it is true we might not always get through to them with our words, but if our words fail, that doesn't mean we quit, because the human spirit is powerful. Michael Sam, a first-team All-American defensive lineman who stood up against a Republican lobbyist claiming that gays should be banned from playing in the NFL, Sam took to the microphone defending who he was and all like him to ensure that gays have just as much right to play in the NFL as does anyone else. Judge me for me, he said. My experience is my sport, not for my sexual orientation. We should then persuade with our actions like the following people did through the power of their spirit. The power of the spirit is alive and well. Let me tell you about a 12-year-old little girl named Malayla Yusuf Zahi. She is from Pakistan and should be an example for us all. She was not afraid to speak up and put pressure on the moral arc of her country. People didn't like the kind of pressure she was bringing. Her crime was simply because she stood up and she spoke out. Did it stop her? No. Even after she was shot in the head by a Taliban gunman, she still stood up, stood her ground, and continues to this day to speak for the rights of children in her country for an education. The power of the spirit can also be seen in 84-year-old Edie Windsor, who by speaking up had her case taken to the U.S. Supreme Court, 
earning a landmark ruling that effectively gutted the so-called Defense of Marriage Act and ultimately put pressure on the Don't Ask, Don't Tell bill. Again, these are just a few examples of those who resisted the poverty of the spirit and were not afraid to stand up and use the power of their spirit to make a difference. They didn't stop and ask, how much is this going to cost me or what's in it for me? Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually has to triumph. By speaking up, they were not, nor can we be, afraid to put pressure on that ark. Otherwise, nothing will change. The human spirit is powerful when driven by purpose. Juniata College has called us to moral maturity. They are committed to the purpose of the spirit. In his leadership philosophy, Dr. Troja lists 16 principles, the first of which is service to others. Humankind's survival is dependent upon our ability to solve the problems of injustice and learn the practical art of living in harmony to serve others. All around us, here and there, an individual or a group dares to love, and to quote President Obama, rises to the majestic heights of moral maturity. So in a real sense, this is a great time to be alive. This is a great time to see that each of us have a single task, a single purpose, standing right in front of us to put our hands on. How do we ensure freedom, justice, and equality for each other? We resist the poverty of the spirit that keeps us from standing shoulder to shoulder in support of those with weakened voices. Instead, we should embrace the power and the purpose of the spirit, which is infectious and stirs each and every one of us with the courage to lend a helping hand to our neighbor and to the world. Your pennies, your nickels, your dimes, your energy, your efforts will make a change. But it has to start from within. So when Dr. King asked a question of that gathered crowd, how long? Not long, because you shall reap what you sow. Surprisingly, Michael Jackson might offer us the best advice towards ensuring that freedom, justice, and equality ring true for us all. I'm talking with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make that change. Angela Myers. I am one of the 91 education POE students here at Juniata College. Now, how does that shape your perception of me? If I had started off my speech by saying that I wanted to become a neurosurgeon and work with the mysteries and complexities of the human mind, would you have sat up a little straighter in your seats, perked up your ears a bit more, seen me as more intelligent and therefore more worthy of your interest? The future neurosurgeons of America and I actually have a lot more in common than you think. As the great American writer John Steinbeck once said, I have come to believe that a great teacher is a great artist, and that there are as few as there are any other great artists. It might even be the greatest of the arts, since the medium is the human mind and spirit. 
So while I may not be cutting into the skull and physically looking and working with the human brain, I will be shaping and molding my students' minds to teach them to be conscious and responsible citizens. If we want freedom, justice, and equality to ring for all, then the place that we need to start is our education system here in the United States. 88% of school-aged children go through the public education system in the U.S., and 1.2 million of those students drop out every year. That's 7,000 each and every day. A PBS report says having a high school diploma means you earn an average of $10,000 more per year than a high school dropout. Those who do not have a high school diploma are 63 times more likely to be incarcerated than a college graduate. Education lifts people out of poverty and greatly improves the quality of life, but only when the teachers are supported. Specifically, we need to focus our attention on our teachers who choose to be there, unlike the students who must be there. We need to love, nurture, respect, and pay our teachers because they touch our future. Instead, unfortunately, we get those who can do and those who can't teach. We've heard it a million times. This is the biggest put down we have for people who are called to be educators. Why would someone choose to make a meager salary instead of becoming a titan of industry? Those who can do and those who can't teach? I'm feeling discouraged already. Okay, think of a skill that you are really good at, really, truly excellent at. Now, what would you have to do to take that information that is in your mind and put it into someone else's? Think of the steps you would have to take. What kind of planning and preparation would you have to do? What would you do if your student didn't understand that particular skill the way that you do? Or what if they just don't learn the same way that you did? How would you give them the freedom to imagine and create? Would you be flexible enough to change your thinking in order to help someone else to understand? Sure, you can do it, but can you teach it? A huge contributing factor to America's negative perception of teachers is government attitude and policies towards teachers. Teachers are the bad guys. Why are our children failing and not keeping up with other nations of the world? The teachers. Why in our inner cities are the graduation rates so low? The teachers. Why is there such a high correlation between low graduation rates and high incarceration statistics? The teachers. Wow, I really have a lot of power to wreak ill and havoc on our society, don't I? <laughs> but if I have the power to bring us all down, then maybe I also have the power to raise us all up. Maybe I can help to make freedom, justice, and equality ring for all, even if only in my own classroom. Are you aware of the hoops created by national and state governments that we education students have to jump through before we even become teachers? We had to be fingerprinted at 18 and had a background check done by the FBI so we could even interact with a student. We had to spend hundreds of dollars on tests that the state changed halfway through our education. They keep changing their minds, and education departments across the country scramble to keep up with what is and isn't important. It's an exhausting system. And everyone is asking questions about education. How can you keep track of students' performance if you aren't testing them constantly? How can you improve teaching if you have no accountability for bad teachers or merit pay for good teachers? We have a lot of questions. And I have an answer. The education system I dream of is already happening in Finland, where they have the number one education system in the world with 100% literacy rates. Finland is this extraordinary place where teachers make just as much, if not more money, than doctors and lawyers. Through Finland's struggle for excellence, they found equality to be the answer. They overhauled their education system 40 years ago using the motto, whatever it takes, and they've never looked back. 
Teachers are respected, revered even, and thoroughly prepared to educate Finland's children. And it truly works. In Finland, they are able to place emphasis in education on equal opportunity to all. That is, equality and excellence go hand in hand, or in the words of Dr. King, intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. Every child should have exactly the same opportunity to learn, regardless of family background, income, or geographic location. Education must be seen first and foremost, not as a way to produce star performers, but as an instrument to even out social inequality. We can learn a lot from Finland. Their idea of whatever it takes is powerful. So what exactly is it going to take? We need to see our teachers as inherently valuable because when you value a person, you trust them and you build a system in which they can flourish. We do whatever it takes so that people want to be teachers because it is a highly competitive and prestigious career. And parents will want their children to go through the public education system because they know their child's teacher will do whatever it takes to treat their child equally and help them to grow and excel. And our government will do whatever it takes to trust and reward our teachers, much in the same way that they trust our doctors and scientists to make our society better, healthier, and smarter. One of Dr. King's respected colleagues Dr. Reverend, Reverend Abernathy said, I don't know what the future may hold, but I know who holds the future. The teachers of America hold our nation's future. The teachers of America hold the future with our nation's children in the palm of their hands. We need to believe in our teachers, just as Dr. King believed in the power of a dream where freedom, justice, and equality ring for all. So remember, those who can do, and somebody taught them how to do it. Colton Hollabook. Our understanding of good nutrition goes back as far as 400 BC when Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food, referring to the food that nature provides for us, the human species. But this isn't 400 BC. This is the US 2014 where 80% of prepackaged processed foods sold in our country are banned in other nations, and where the increase of processed foods has been linked to the continual increase of disease. The US Department of Health reports that on average 580,000 Americans die each year due to highly preventable diet-related diseases. And to think that within those deaths are hundreds of thousands of more people who lost a loved one and were left wondering why and if they could have done more. Dr. King strongly advocated the idea that all hearts should be as one, regardless of one's race, class, age, or gender. My question is, how can all hearts be as one if some hearts are unable to beat? Because the truth of the matter is that we cannot fight against, let alone experience, discrimination 
unless our internal organs get the food that they need to function. Just as health author Augustine Burroughs said, when you have your health, you have everything. And when you do not have your health, nothing else matters at all. As a health communication student, I am eager to educate and advocate for a more equitable solution to health inequality. With what you learn about the food industry here tonight, I hope you will help me push back against their deceptive practices that rob us of our right to a healthy life. So how does the corporate food industry rob us of our right to a healthy life? The food industry understands how diverse its audience is with regard to social class, race, health status, and education level, and exploits these differences for profit. For instance, have you ever wondered why there is a higher prevalence of fast food restaurants in low-income neighborhoods? And why research shows that often economically disadvantaged groups live farther from stores with healthier options? It's because fast food companies have recognized the financial benefit of offering low-income families cheap and accessible food. And the sad truth is, areas with high concentrations of fast food restaurants are almost three times more likely to be high in mortality rates, according to a study published in the Canadian Journal of Public Health. How is this just? How does anyone allow the food industry to profit by taking advantage of the disadvantaged and rob their right to a healthy life? And it doesn't stop there. In response to a study reporting that children eating school lunches are two times more likely to be obese than students who pack, the Obama administration took a proposal to Congress to make school lunches healthier. This genuine attempt to lessen health inequity for school children was destroyed by the food industry. Food companies lobbied in Congress, preventing Obama's proposal, and even got a bill passed which allows tomato paste on frozen pizza to count as one of the required serving of vegetables that schools provide. Just as Dr. King said himself, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The injustice experienced by the disadvantaged and school children in America is an injustice to us all. And as if this unjust act isn't already hard enough to digest, we must now explore the deceptive practices that perpetuate health inequality. The food industry can attribute a majority of their success to their ability to manipulate and deceive consumers into thinking that their products are actually healthy. This allows companies to craft their food labels to hide the deadly truth. For example, we see this in some forms of fruit juice in the supermarket, with a big and bold claim on the front, no sugar added. And yet, with a closer look, we find that the product is concentrated fruit juice. What is that but a form of sugar? I can't help but think about my mother in this situation, a type 2 diabetic who spends every day monitoring her each and every bite in order to sustain her life on this planet. And for someone who must monitor her sugar intake closely, how can a food company feel good about tricking her into thinking that she isn't consuming extra sugar? This form of trickery is seen in various labels all across the shelves of the supermarket. Chicken, raised without hormones. Well, that's awesome, considering the FDA does not permit the use of hormones in poultry. <laughs> Made with real fruit, Yet companies don't have to provide the quantity of the fruit in the ingredients label and often will add minuscule amounts just to make the claim. And when a product is a light version, it often refers to the flavor and not the ingredients. The flavor might be lighter, but you aren't saving calories. My point is that the food industry doesn't just take advantage of our disadvantages, but also infringes on our right to know by deliberately misleading us. Let it be known, the food industry's deceptive practices breaches our right to knowledge, to know the truth. This is unfair. This is unjust. This is health inequality. So how do we fight health inequality? How do individuals fight against powerful companies who claim that they have our best interests at heart? The solution is to use our knowledge to push back to refuse to accept and prevent this industry from promoting health inequalities. Armed with knowledge, we must push back to refuse to accept the lies that we've been fed. That is the solution, and it works. 
Recently, General Mills removed all genetically modified ingredients from their Cheerio recipe in response to thousands of concerned consumers who flooded their Facebook page expressing their outrage. A small group of mothers who shared a vision of health for today's children pushed back. Their success can be attributed to their refusal to accept the Cheerio recipe and that knowledge that gave them the courage to push back and demand a healthier product. If everyone believed that they couldn't make a difference, how could we ever expect liberty to ring for all? And what would have happened if Dr. King had believed that he was just one person who couldn't make a difference? Think about someone who you care for with all of your heart and ask yourself, what would I do if there was someone in this world that purposely set out to make them less healthy and more susceptible to disease? How would you feel if you knew your loved one was dying because someone robbed them of the chance to live disease-free? Or if someone else had led them to believe that what they were doing was for the benefit of their health when it was actually doing more harm? In order for the food industry to stop robbing us of our right to health, and in order for them to stop their dangerous, deceptive practices, we must come together as a society and push back. We must do it for the health of our neighbors, for the health of our family, our friends, the children of America, and most importantly, for ourselves. Because the solution to health inequality is not in the hands of the food industry. It is in the hands of each and every one of us. Ezra Nikki Halstead. In life, we all have to make choices. Choices that will inevitably change everything in your life, depending on the time, the place, and the way you execute them. Some people hate change. Others embrace it. For me, when I was growing up, I hated most changes. For example, when I was 13, I hated moving from the house I grew up in. I even hated when I got a new puppy because I wasn't used to it yet. It was something I had to adapt to. This winter, we've all had to adapt to the polar vortex. And just like that new puppy, I hated it. Simple as that. However, things only got harder for me when I started growing up and discovering more and more and about myself and my own identity and what that meant for me living in the world that currently exists. Now, I come to embrace changes because, well, I don't have really much of a choice, especially at this time in my life. Being a member of the LGBTQ community can be exhausting at times. It was exhausting for me to just come out to people when I identified as a lesbian. It felt like I literally had to do it every day. Almost like I would jump out of a closet, awkwardly yell, I'm gay, and then run right back in to get ready for the next group of people. <laughs> it's like I worked at a terribly put together haunted house. Come to think of it, I bet the town I grew up in would have hired me to scare the locals, since being different in any way isn't very appreciated there. When Martin Luther King Jr. talked about having a dream 50 years ago, he wasn't just talking about civil rights for African Americans. He was talking about equal rights for everyone. 
That march on Washington in 1963 not only led to the passage of significant civil rights legislation, but it also allowed Dr. King to advocate for other human rights causes, like poverty and workers' rights. I fully believe that if he were here today, he would have extended work to equality, for equality to other minority groups in the United States and quite possibly the world. But right now, we are here. And in order to achieve equality, we have to start local. Equality starts with places like Juniata. I fully believe that change works from the bottom up. So what can we do here? Well, we can start by being aware of what happens to others and changing the way we respond to these incidents. Two years ago, a guy pushed me and verbally assaulted me in good hall because of the way I was dressed. Have you heard about it? Maybe, but what did you do about it? Maybe you felt bad for me. Maybe you talked to your fellow colleagues about it and about how horrible it was. But what did you actually physically do to try to make Juniata a better, safer place for everyone? You probably did nothing. You did nothing in the hopes that someone else would figure this problem out, and then we could go on our merry way of getting the heck out of here and moving on to the next big thing. It was just an isolated incident anyway, right? The truth is, however, that over 80% of LGBTQ high school students have reported being verbally and physically assaulted at school. But we've all heard Charles Darwin's argument about adaptation. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Looking back on what happened to me, I realized that some people are just struggling to adapt to these changes, and that can be very uncomfortable. As an institution, we tend to make sure the student as an individual is okay, but not about the student body as a whole. We have a tendency to deal with things on a case-by-case -case basis instead of addressing the structural problem. While it is wonderful to know that you personally have support, being taken care of one by one does nothing to ensure that it will never happen again. Our approach is not showcasing our true adaptability, and I know we can do better. It's time to stop acting like everything is okay once the incident is over. We need to stand up for others who are brought down when it comes to basic human rights. We need everyone to not only be aware of the problems that are happening around us, but also be actively involved in changing them. I am just beginning to live as a transgender male, and one of my simple goals in life is to be able to go to the bathroom without being told I'm in the wrong one. If I choose to go to the men's room, I get weird, upset, or even threatening glares 100% of the time. If I choose the women's room, I hear soft whispers and laughter. When this happens, I want nothing more than to lock myself into a stall and never come out again. It's like sitting at the whites only counter in Greensboro, North Carolina in the 1960s and feeling that hatred and refusal from other people just because your skin is a different color. With all of the challenges we have to face, it's sometimes hard to just get up in the morning. Every day I become less and less connected with my family. I become more and more in debt from college. I have nowhere to go when I graduate as of now. And most of these things are partially because of the choices I've made as I've been accepting who I am. But do I regret it at all? Not even a little bit. Would Martin Luther King Jr. have stopped protesting for equal rights if he knew he would be assassinated? Absolutely not. Harvey Milk, one of my all-time inspirations, who was also murdered during his life devoted to equal rights, said that rights are won only by those who make their voices heard. If a bullet should enter my brain, let that bullet destroy every closet door. We need to break out of the boxes we are put in. You are not disgusting or used if you have been sexually assaulted. You are not a freak because of whom you love or how you identify. You are not subject to discrimination because your skin is darker. 
what really needs to happen, and it is the most important, is we need to join together, despite all of our differences and our amazing diversity, and fight for each other. The fight needs to stop being for just one individual, one community, and start being for humanity. Our world is changing, our identities are evolving, we will adapt, but how we adapt is not inevitable. There are times when change just seems to happen, and then there are times when you have to choose it. So Juniata, let's choose it right now. Let's adapt out of our own free will, embrace it, unlock our true potential for making this world a better place. One person can move a rock, but a group can move a boulder. Imagine what we could do if we all fight together as a college to invoke change then as an entire Huntington community, and hopefully one day, together with the rest of the world. Juniata College, let's move those mountains. Alexandra Bernowski. I was having a conversation with a friend about the world and inequality. We had heard that according to data from the World Bank, as of the year 2010, about 21% of the world's population lived on less than $1.25 a day. My friend and I were sitting back, sipping tea, wearing Gap and Abercrombie. Reflecting on the statistic, we began to talk about economic inequality. Now, depending on your background, poverty might seem distant from you. However, we wouldn't have to travel very far to find it. In Huntingdon, almost 13% of the population lives in poverty. That's about one out of every seven or eight people. That I am speaking to you about this may seem ironic. What gives me the right to talk about poverty? I want to talk about it because it is unjust. So for the sake of the conversation, I would like to lay aside irony. Instead, let me be sincere. The reality is some people are more wealthy than others. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2011, the wealthiest Americans spent in total almost five times more than the poorest. What's more is that they spent about twice as much on extra things like restaurant bills and personal products than the poorest spent altogether. In part, this reality is based on exploitation. People with money profit from poverty, both domestically and internationally. We can fight economic inequality by opposing powerful people who profit from exploitation. What obligates us to fight is both our role in the problem and our ability to solve it. To promote economic equality, we need to stop justifying exploitation and to start voting with our wallets for what we ourselves have decided is just. But who are we? We are the people who have money to spend. Now already we might be justifying ourselves. After all, we aren't millionaires. However, one dollar that we spend 
has the same power as a dollar spent by anyone else. We can call that spending power, which explains the relationship between freedom, justice, and economic class. So knowing that we have spending power, how do we impact others? How do we hurt? And how can we help? In this country, when we say liberty and justice for all, who is all? The answer lies in the Pledge of Allegiance. When people pledge, all is who they agree to protect. You're probably familiar with the pledge, but here's a new perspective. If you take out its middle and uh, if you take out its middle and keep its beginning and end, you have this. I pledge allegiance to liberty and justice for all. Do you hear that? I pledge allegiance to liberty and justice for all. In its entirety, the pledge describes allegiance to the republic, not to companies. What then has happened to our priorities? Are we no longer citizens, but have become mere consumers? Our dollars are our votes, and in this way, we have been voting for economic inequality for years. To understand these votes, let's trace them back to ourselves. The harm that we do is rooted in how we justify it, and there are various crafty ways in which we do that. Quite often, we simply deny the consequences of our actions. We say, it doesn't matter, or I can't help it. But above all, the most honest reason behind what we do is that we do what is convenient, what benefits us. These and other justifications are explained by Dr. Gerard Hauser in the rhetorical theory textbook used here at Juniata. From my perspective, we, in particular, use three popular justifications. For short, I call them the temptation, the attitude, and the excuse. And in each are reflections of Dr. Hauser's ideas. First of these is the yield to a temptation, such as a low price or simple convenience. But think about it. There are times when what we buy is cheap because someone else is paying the difference. That person is not likely to be a rich uncle or a mysterious benefactor. No. What I mean is that some worker could be paying with underpaid labor. Next is the attitude, which is to say, I deserve it. This could be an innocent, honest thought. We earn our money after all. The problem with this attitude is that even if I work hard, if I barely ever treat myself, even then, no one deserves to be exploited, and no one deserves to be a profiteer. Finally, there is the excuse. We tell ourselves that we are powerless, and to try to change the world is pointless. But many great leaders have challenged this excuse. One example is Margaret Mead, an activist of the 1960s who is credited with one of the most famous quotes of the decade. Perhaps you are familiar. Never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. It is frustrating to know that if you do change your habits, you will have to watch as others profit from doing what you gave up. Imagine standing by your principles in a crowd of opposition. Imagine being a vegetarian at pig roast. What do you do? If you face poverty and exploitation in silence, your impact is limited to only whatever you can reach. However, if you arm yourself with facts, you can reach further. You can challenge those who profit from poverty and take away their support. Your change can inspire more change. When we act as informed citizens, we cannot so easily justify exploitation nor decisions that support it. If we challenge our choices as well as those of others, then we begin to make a broader positive change. Does that sound idealistic to you? It should. And it's just as idealistic as a pledge to liberty and justice for all. The fact that you are on this campus hearing this speech 
indicates that you are in good company if you want to arm yourself with knowledge. With that knowledge, you're also in a position to empower your spending and, as the saying goes, to vote with your wallet. Going back to the chat between my friend and me, this is what we decided. To arm ourselves against ignorance so that we cannot justify exploitation. It's true that we don't know how we got our tea or our Gap and Abercrombie jeans. But we will learn. And then, as responsible citizens and consumers, we will vote with our dollars and our cents against exploitation and for equality. Rinaldo Liam. Decades ago, Dr. Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Yet, even today, many people, you and me, we remain silent. The National Crime Victimization Survey reported that 70% of witnesses of assault tend to sit down and remain silent. Moreover, the National Commission for the Promotion of Equality shows that nearly all victims of racial and religious discrimination choose not to report to anyone. Like them, often we say nothing and watch destruction of things that matter in our life, such as equality, justice, and freedom. We have let history record our silence. Was Dr. King right? Have our lives begun to end? I was born and raised in Indonesia. I have studied in Singapore and the United States of America for almost eight years, and I have been taught that I am and we are citizens of the world. In order for equality, justice, and freedom to ring for all people, we, citizens of the world, must speak up. It is because Silence breeds torture. Silence breeds pain. But speaking up brings change. Let us think back to the year of 1998. What was happening at Juniata College? I am sure that Juniata students were still complaining about baker food. <laughs> or monstrous amount of work in front of the students. And that classes were not being canceled even though there were snowstorms and that slippery sheets of ice. <laughs> but what was happening in my home country, Indonesia, in 1998? Indonesia was not as peaceful as Huntingdon. For 32 years, dictatorship crushed people's voices and worsened ethnic-based class inequality. This and for silence brought about the tragedy of human torture. In May 1998, there was a massacre of my ethnic group, the Chinese Indonesians. The Chinese Indonesians, regardless of, regardless of age, men and women, were tortured, raped, and burned to death. Jakarta Globe, Indonesia's leading news source, reported that more than 168 women were gang raped during the rioting. Many were raped in front of their family members. Over 1,000 people were killed at the time. 
Back then, I was just a seven-year-old kid. My family and I hid at home, closed our curtains, and saw the military prowling outside of my house. The only defense we had was just a taser on my dad's shivering hand. Hiding for our lives was bleak. It was frightening, and it is still a heartbreaking memory. The long separation of people's right to speak out resulted in this tragedy of human torture. Ali Wiesel, a prize winner for speaking out against violence, said, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Even though torture in Indonesia may seem miles away to you, the painful memory is still very close to my heart. Today, you do not have to travel miles away to find pain caused by silence, as this case happened a few years ago in our community. Our neighbor university, Penn State, faced a case of child sexual abuse by Jerry Sandusky. The prosecuting attorney reported that those 45 victims had been silenced. Pen Life by the Patriot News reported that one was afraid of being rediscovered. Some were dissuaded from being honest, and some were even being scolded and bullied into silence. Even the janitors who witnessed him engaging in child sexual abuse in the year of 2000 did not report this scandal. The news came out 10 years after the act. The American Psychological Association reported that adults who were sexually abused as children experienced depression, anxiety, and self-destructive behaviors. Moreover, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Corbett said, there are monsters among us. There are people who will hurt children for their own sexual satisfaction. And we do have to report. We do have to follow up. I know that unfortunately, we are going to see conduct like that again because there are people who will do this again and again and again. These helpless young children needed justice. However, long silence brought eternal pain for those victims. Let us imagine, imagine if people in Indonesia and people around the world had spoken up about class inequality sooner, many tortured lives could have been saved. Imagine if people had spoken up sooner on behalf of those helpless children, their painful life could have been avoided. And imagine, if heroes of the world, such as Dr. Martin Luther King, had chosen to remain silent, what would our society be like today? Silence breeds torture and pain, but when our voices are heard, speaking up can create change for a better society. Our home, Juniata College, is committed to creating active, supporting, and safe environment so that equality justice, and freedom can ring for all. Juniata has a bias response team, notice of concern, and multiple events such as Bailey Oratorical, open forums, and student panels. And the way for Juniata to fulfill its commitment is for us, the community, to use our constitutional right that we are born free to speak out for ourselves and speak out for others. And through every piece of our writing, our artwork, and our speeches, Juniata and the world will hear our voices. And tonight, the world hear my voice. Together, we can create change for a better society by speaking up. Decades ago, Dr. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. With love, courage is born. And through this courage, we, free citizens of the world, will speak up, be heard, and create change. And never again, we will let history 
record our silence. Let history record our voice. Elise Moranian. It shouldn't surprise you to hear that I've always been keen on the power of small. How little things can have a big impact. This idea was the focus of Dr. Mary Rowe's research at MIT during the 70s. Her work uncovered how the small, subtle, everyday inequalities are infinitely more powerful and far more pervasive than the large, transparent issues of injustice at hand. This year, commemorating the 50-year anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech, President Obama said, we would dishonor the heroes who marched on Washington to suggest that the work of our nation is somehow complete. Although significant movements towards justice and equality have been made, I argue that we have more work to do. The way to make freedom, justice, and equality ring is to make the subtle, small, everyday, micro inequalities that are so fluid in our lives transparent. Though micro inequities seem normal, they separate and marginalize individuals. It's time to recognize and overcome them. Leading psychologists at Columbia University define micro inequities as the everyday slights, put downs, indignities, and insults experienced by people of color, women, LGBTQ populations, and anyone who's marginalized in their day-to-day -day interactions with others. They're the ways in which individuals are singled out, overlooked, discounted or ignored based on an unchangeable characteristic such as race or sexual orientation. Our language, institutions, and attitudes reflect micro inequities that look innocent and therefore go unnoticed, unrecognized, and unchallenged. Sometimes micro inequities even appear to be compliments. Wow, your English is so good. Or you're a great dancer for a white girl. But the problem is, these words contain messages that are often insulting and reflect deeply held assumptions and bias. I've heard a few examples right here at Juniata. All Asians are good at math. Or, as a woman, what's it like to study physics? And one of the most common, that's so gay. We hear these things all the time. Recently in a meeting, my division vice president referred to me as sweetheart. Sweetheart? Really? Now, I'm not going to march on Washington because someone called me sweetheart, but why do these things sound so normal, yet make us feel so insignificant? It happens on an institutional level as well. At Juniata, our faculty meetings are Wednesdays from 4.30 to 6. But with daycare and bus stop pickups, Who's leaving these meetings early to be with the kids? 
whose voice isn't being heard. Because micro inequities are small and subtle, they often go unnoticed. Micro inequities are like a drop of water on stone. One drop or an isolated event affects one person one time. But as a repeated pattern, these drops turn into a trickle and they begin to erode even the strongest of stones. Micro inequities marginalize by pointing to differences instead of similarities. They divide us instead of unite us. In Barriers to Equality, the Power of Subtle Discrimination, Dr. Rowe affirms that micro inequities work by excluding people of difference. As I began investigating this topic, classmates started pouring out their stories. An African-American student on this campus was recently approached by a peer. You know, I've been meaning to tell you, you speak really well for a black guy. One of my classmates from Pakistan was asked just last week, Pakistan, do they have beds in your country? However absurd or trivial these messages may seem, they can be extremely isolating. In my case, being called sweetheart at work may very well have been unintentional and said without malicious motives, but the implied message of all micro inequities are proven to be the same. You do not belong. You're not like us. You're intellectually inferior. You cannot be trusted. And perhaps the worst of all, all you people are the same. Instead of connection, micro inequities create distance. Karl Marx, philosopher and sociologist said, we become ourselves through the relations we have in society and its communities. And for those who are marginalized, their selfhood, their humanity is threatened. Subtle messages that disempower begin to rust the human mind, heart, and spirit. They communicate to us our worth and our place in society, who we are and who others expect us to be. So how do we overcome this? What can each and every one of us do to combat the micro inequities that are so deeply embedded into our lives? Micro inequities occur because they're outside the level of our consciousness, woven into our language and our institutions. We need to recognize them. We need to put these inequalities under a microscope because though they're small, they are not trivial. They can leave lasting and detrimental impact. We need to think again. We all need to be more thoughtful about our own words, our own assumptions, and the micro inequities that we all perpetuate every day. Micro inequities are so normalized. They marginalize people, and the time to recognize and address them is now. Let's return to small. Science has proven that it will be the small things, like virus and bacteria, that put an end to all of humankind. It will be the small, near invisible things that either kill us or save us. Small matters. It can be one small person with a large voice or a large person with a small voice, but what's important is that we are all part of this change. We can start with our words. Let's start a new wave, with each word being a droplet and each phrase building pools of support around one another. Let's ride Dr. King's tide of change. Let's be advocates for minorities and allies for anyone who's being marginalized. Tonight, we stand side by side as we continue to march for civil rights, not only in finding our own sense of social equality, but in earning it for others. There is a power of small. And in the words of revolutionary rapper Macklemore, no law is going to change us. We have to change us. So progress, march on. heavy.
It's all right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give them one more huge round of applause. Amazing. You guys were amazing. Thanks for being such a great audience and helping our speakers be the best that they can be. The judges are going to deliberate. It should take about 20 minutes. We have some refreshments. We really encourage you to stay and wait to find out who won. It will not be a long wait. There are the Communication and Media Club have refreshments available. There are also some door prizes. And you will, if you, you have your phones with you, you will have an opportunity to vote for the People's Choice Award. All right? So in that light, I don't see you, Allie, but I'd like to introduce Allie Bloomling. There we go. Thanks, Allie. I can't say I envy these judges at all. What about you guys? I want to give them another, I'm tempted to ask you for another round of applause for them. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. I'm Allie Bloomling. I'm the active president of the Communication and Media Club, who co-sponsors this event with, the, with our home department. Um, I'm here to announce the door prizes for the event tonight, but before I do that, I want to let you know of a special opportunity to be your own judge for these competitors. When you go out into the lobby for intermission, you'll see a screen just like this one to my right with the name of each contestant on it. Each name corresponds to a number, which you'll text in to vote for the speech you like the best. The person who receives the most votes will be awarded the People's Choice Award, which I will announce when we come back from the break. Before you leave for some light refreshments, though, I'd like you to check under your chairs or under the arms of your chairs for either a green or red post-it note If you find a post-it note under your seat, sorry. <laughs> if you find a post-it note under your seat, please bring it forward before we go to the break um, to come claim your door prize. Thank you. And thank you for supporting the Bailey Oratorical.
Yeah, that was very moving and all that. Thank you. That was a great connection.
Okay, so before Dr. Troja comes up here to announce the awards, I'm going to announce the results of the People's Choice Award. Um, with 26% of the votes, tonight's People's Choice Award goes to Angela Myers. <laughs> okay, Dr. Troja. Well, you, I, I'm going to get there. Let me, I know. Um, let me just say, um, you, you didn't disappoint. You know, as I was expecting, well, I'm not sure what I was expecting as I was coming into this event, but um, you surpassed that. And so congratulations to each and every one of you. Did a fantastic job. One more round of applause for all of our presenters. I'm humbled. I really am. Uh, I, I'm so proud to be to be up here to represent this institution, to represent all of you, and um, you know it's a good night when you're listening to remarks to a program when you have laughed, you have cried, you have thought, um, and I did all those tonight. Uh, thanks to all of you. So uh, it's a my first Bailey, and I, I will never forget. So I, I appreciate it so much. So here we go. Whew, gosh, I'm nervous. <laughs> In third place, and the winner of the $300 uh, prize is Miss Angela Myers. Second place and the winner of 
$500 prize is Elise Moranian. So I heard a great story over dinner. Can I share this story? I'm, this is a little scary because I'm afraid of what might happen to the cup. But for those of you who are hockey fans, uh, what do they do with the Stanley Cup when they win the Stanley Cup? They take it back to their home city, right? And they do, they, 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 yes, they, 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 they consume beverages out of this cup. And one of our previous winners the year that Dr. Weimer was on sabbatical had asked about taking that down to memories, uh, was it? Uh, was that how the story goes, Dr. Worley? <laughs> okay. I'm not recommending that tonight, but I thought it was a, uh, a cute story. Okay, so to, um, to our winner for the 2014 and 104th uh, Bailey, the winner and the... Um, thousand dollar check that goes with that is to Ronaldo Liam. thank all of you for your participation, for being such a fabulous audience, and I wish you a very, very lovely evening. Think great thoughts about great speeches because you heard seven of them. Good night, everybody. Good night. You did.